good evening good morning good afternoon wherever you are thanks for participating in the asia pacific glaucoma society webinar on clinical conundrums in glaucoma practice we thank elergan for their kind support to support this webinar i am nazrul islam from bangladesh i will be moderating this session along with my esteemed colleague Dr. Chen Yun Kim from Seoul, Korea. We have three distinguished speakers from India, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh. Dr. Kim will introduce them soon. Uh, before that, let me talk a few words about Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society. Uh, as you know that uh, Glaucoma Society has some benefits if you become a member. So I'd request all of you who are not yet member, please become the member of the Glaucoma Society. And if you become a member, then we have discount in the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Congress uh, in every two years. You can join, you can have the clinical education, very rich platform in the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society webinar. You can also participate in the electoral voting to be the office bearers of the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society. You can have collaborative sessions with the different societies, American Glaucoma Society, European Glaucoma Society, and many other national Glaucoma Societies. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? You can see that you have different webinars, master classes, and you can have the access to this recording of the webinars, master class, and very different, uh, beautiful and necessary video clips of the glaucoma surgery by our members. I think you will be a member and will enjoy all the session. Now I would request my esteemed colleague, Dr. Chan Yoon Kim to introduce our distinguished speakers. Dr. Chen, Chan Yoon Kim, please. Oh, thank you, Dr. Islam. I will introduce the today's presentation of Thank you, Dr. Islam. The first speak uh, presentation will be by uh, Dr. Diluani Arya Singha. Uh, she will be sp speak on ocular hypertension to treat or two way. A second presentation will be presented by Dr. Sirisha Sentel. Uh, she will speak on progression despite intraocular pressure control. Am I missing something? And finally, Dr. Najrul Islam will speak on drops to surgery, when and what. Uh, please enjoy the whole presentation. Thank you. Uh, good evening. At the outset, I would like to thank the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society for giving me this opportunity. The topic I'm going to discuss today is ocular hypertension, treat or to wait. I have no financial disclosures. I thought I'll start my presentation with two case scenarios. First patient is a 62 year old gentleman who presented to us 12 years ago for a regular checkup. His vision was fine, but his intraocular pressures were elevated, 24 in his right eye and 22 mercury millimeters in his left. These were the fondest photos at the time of presentation. Both optic discs were healthy. His CCT was normal. In 2009, we used to do GDX scans and it showed a normal nerve fiber layer in both eyes. We decided to follow this patient without treatment. These were the normal visual fields in 2012 and in 2015. Then in 2017, he developed a superior notch in his right optic disc. The OCT in 2017 showed a significant superior nerve fiber layer defect in his right eye and a corresponding inferior visual field defect in the same. At that point, we started him on treatment. This was the field of vision in 2020. Despite topical hypertensive treatment, he progressed further and we added a second medication. 
Second patient is a 54-year-old lady who also came for a regular checkup in 2012. Her vision was fine. Her intraocular pressures were also elevated. Right was 26 and left was 24. Her optic disc at the time of presentation appeared normal. CCT was normal. OCT was also normal. We decided to follow her without treatment. These are the fundus photos in 2021 with normal healthy discs. OCT scans are still unremarkable. Visual fields still remain normal. So two patients, both with high intraocular pressure, ocular hypertension, after similar time frames, one went on to develop primary open angle glaucoma and the other did not. So now we come across these questions. What to do with these patients? How often should they be examined? Is preventive treatment effective? Is a treatment, if treatment is needed, who should be treated? Although the definition of ocular hypertension has evolved through the years, it is commonly defined as a condition with an intraocular pressure greater than 21 mercury millimeters, measured in one or both eyes at two or more occasions with no detectable optic disc or no fiber layer damage or no signs of glaucoma evident on visual field testing. It is estimated that in the United States, four to eight percent older than 40 years have elevated intraocular pressure without detectable glaucomatous damage. Ocular hypertension is 10 to 15 times more likely to occur than primary open angle glaucoma. The number of affected people will certainly increase with increasing life expectancy. Managing this large group of people is linked with substantial cost for examination, test and treatment, but can we ignore this group of people? No, we can't. Why? Because elevated intraocular pressure is a leading risk factor and it is the only modifiable risk factor at present for the development of primary open angle glaucoma. In addition, patients can lose a substantial proportion of their nerve fiber layer before glaucoma is detected by standard clinical tests. So now we come to this great question. Does treatment of ocular hypertension prevent primary open angle glaucoma? Studies over the last 30 years have helped to characterize those with ocular hypertension. Some studies were not in favor of medical treatment, but some studies were in favor of medical treatment. But there were so many limitations in those older studies, and there was no consensus on the efficacy of medical treatment in delaying or preventing the onset of glaucoma among individuals with elevated IOP. Then the ocular hypertension treatment study was designed. It is the largest randomized trial on OHT to date. It was designed to evaluate the safety and efficacy of topical ocular hypertensive medication in delaying or preventing the onset of primary open angle glaucoma in individuals with ocular hypertension. These were the eligibility criteria. Phase one was started in 1994. A total of 1,636 participants who fulfilled the eligibility criteria were randomized to either observation or treatment with commercially available topical ocular hypertensive medication. The goal of the medication group was to reduce the IOP by 20% or more to reach an IOP of 24 mercury millimeters or less. The primary outcome was the development of reproducible visual field abnormality or reproducible optic disc deterioration attributed to glaucoma. So during the course of this study, the mean reduction in IOP in the medication group was 22.5%. At 60 months, the cumulative probability of developing POAG was 4.4% in the medication group compared to 9.5% in the observation group. There was a trend for treatment to be less protective among self-identified African-American participants. However, the data suggests that this racial effect may be due in part to larger baseline cup to ratios and thinner central corneas. 
the inclusion of these factors caused race to become statistically insignificant in the multivariate model. So while the first phase of ocular hypertensive treatment study provided a proof of concept of the value of early treatment, the study did not inform clinicians as to when individuals with ocular hypertension should initiate treatment. The most effective and cost-effective approach depends on whether there is a penalty for delaying treatment. Then the second phase of OHTS was designed in which the medication was offered to all participants in the observation group, while participants in the medication group continued treatment. This created two groups, early treatment group and delayed treatment group. Therefore, they were able to compare the cumulative incidence of POAG in the medication group, which was treated for the entire duration of the odds, that is 13 years, with that in the observation group, which was treated only for 5.5 years. Among participants who developed POAG, the median time to develop glaucoma was six years in the observation group and 8.7 years in the medication group. A five-factor model, the older age, higher IOP, thinner central corneal thickness, larger cup to disc ratio, and higher visual field PSD were confirmed to be predictive factors for the development of POAG in individuals with ocular hypertension. Myopia was not predictive of the development of POAG in OHS. Delaying treatment in OHD patients increased the cumulative incidence of glaucoma at 13 years. It resulted in more eyes with structural and functional damage, more participants with bilateral disease, and shorter time to develop glaucoma. But waiting does not have a large effect on MD and PSD within five years of developing POAG. The phase three of OATS determined the cumulative incidence and severity of POAG after 20 years of follow-up among participants in the OATS. But only one fourth of participants developed visual field loss in either eye over a long-term follow-up. All phases of OATS allow us to draw some important conclusions about management of ocular hypertension. Early medical treatment, decreases the cumulative incidence of POAG. The absolute effect is greatest in high-risk individuals. Conversely, there's little absolute benefit of early treatment in low-risk individuals. There are several other large randomized trials, such as European Glaucoma Prevention Study, which I'm not going to go into detail. So how can we incorporate the information from these studies into clinical practice? Clinicians should use this information to decide the appropriateness of initiating, continuing or discontinuing topical medication in patients with ocular hypertension. One needs to be careful in labeling a patient with a false positive diagnosis of glaucoma as it can lead to severe frustrating consequences which can hamper their quality of life. At the same time, if the patients do develop glaucoma, living with glaucoma is also not easy. This is itself, as well as medical treatment, can have an enormous impact on patients' quality of life. Furthermore, there are increased depression rates among patients with glaucoma. Many studies have investigated the relationship between glaucoma, anxiety, and depression. As a result of its asymptomatic chronic nature, and potential outcome of blindness, glaucoma often imposes a psychological burden. So how can we make a decision on initiating treatment in patients with ocular hypertension? Decision on treatment should be based on these factors. Most OHD patients are at low risk. Most low risk OHD patients can be followed without medication. Delaying treatment for 7.5 years resulted in only a small absolute increase in POAG in low-risk patients. Starting treatment at diagnosis has no major negative effect on prognosis over five years. 
Over a five-year period, several studies have shown the incidence of glaucomatous damage in people with ocular hypertension to be low for intraocular pressures of 21 to 25, moderate for IOPs 26 to 30, and high for those higher than 30 mercury millimeters. So one needs to consider treatment if pressures are consistently higher than 20 to 30 mercury millimeters. The risk calculators are available to calculate the five-year risk of glaucoma in OHD patients. The prediction model presented here is derived from two studies, ocular hypertension treatment study and the European glaucoma prevention study, and could be useful to clinicians. But there is no guarantee that this predicted risk is accurate for that individual patient. The predictions derived using these methods are designed to aid, but not to replace clinical judgment. This shows the cumulative 13-year incidence of POAG for lowest, middle, and highest baseline risk groups. So clinicians should consider initiating treatment for individuals with ocular hypertension who are at moderate or high risk for developing POAG. Also, one should not miss the impact of increasing life expectancy. Even in countries like ours, patients live longer than most doctors predict. High risk of conversion to glaucoma can occur even with a moderate five-year risk. Low perfusion pressures has also been associated with the risk of POAG in patients with ocular hypertension. This may be an important consideration in the decision to treat OHD patients. Clinicians and patients can make evidence-based decisions about the management of ocular hypertension using the risk model and considering patients' age, medical status, life expectancy, and personal preference. If you elect to follow up these patients, they require a timely visit, appropriate test and interpretation, and risk status assessment over time, as it can change over time. If you elect to treat, there are safe and effective treatment options. The ideal drug for OHD should effectively lower IOP, have no side effects, and be inexpensive with once-a-day dosing. However, the potential benefit of treatment should outweigh the low conversion rate to glaucoma, as well as the cost, inconvenience, and potential adverse effects. At the same time, one needs to remember not to burden these ocular hypertensive patients with treatment. In a summary, all studies do not imply that all individuals with elevated IOP should be treated. The decision to recommend treatment should involve many factors, such as the low overall incidence of POAG among individuals with ocular hypertension, the burden of long-term treatment, the individual's risk of developing POAG, the individual's likelihood of being helped by treatment, and the individual's health status and life expectancy. The aim of the therapeutic relationship should be to prevent glaucomatous visual loss and to minimize the impact of treatment in patients with ocular hypertension. This information, together with the prediction model, may help clinicians and patients to make informed, personalized decisions about the management of ocular hypertension. These are my references, and thank you. Hello, friends. Uh, today's topic for discussion is progression of glaucoma despite normal intraocular pressure. Am I missing something? So before we move on to understanding what do we do when it progresses, let us understand how do we treat glaucoma. We all know that intraocular pressure is the only treatable risk factor. All that we do by means of medications, laser, or surgery is to control the intraocular pressure. Most often, decreasing the intraocular pressure is beneficial and prevents progression to a great extent. Even in patients with normal intraocular pressure or the so-called normotensive glaucomas, we know that intraocular pressure reduction is definitely beneficial even in the long-term studies. And studies have shown that inadequate intraocular pressure control and intraocular pressure fluctuations are important risk factors for progression. 
So if somebody progresses, despite having the intraocular pressures in the target intraocular pressure range, are there any other factors that could be leading to progression and how do we assist them? We understand that majority of our patients are uh, easily manageable. Close to about 5 to 10% of our patients, sometimes we do face difficulties with progression despite our best efforts and treatment. So what we are trying to look at is, could there be other factors? Should we be looking at something else that we are missing in case these people progress? There are several studies that have looked at the ocular perfusion, uh, the effect of oxidative stress, sleep disorders, uh, the problems with nocturnal fluctuations in blood pressure, all of these associated with progression of glaucoma. So we, when we see a patient who's progressing, despite normal intraocular pressure, what all can we evaluate? We definitely need to look at the ocular factors, see if there are significant fluctuations in intraocular pressure, is the target intraocular pressure all right? Do we need to reset the target intraocular pressure? Systemically, does this patient have any other problem related to vascular dysregulation, hypercoagulable states, or problems with sleep apnea, insufficient blood supply, hypotension, or is there any other neurological factor? Or sometimes the behavioral changes itself, like uh, starting from exercise, certain types of exercises, excessive water therapy, and things like that. So first and foremost, whenever we see that there is a progression, I think it is very important to confirm whether this is true progression or not. How do we do that? Simply by repeating the visual field analysis. Sometimes we do understand there's a lot of fluctuations that happen and long-term fluctuations, especially if somebody has not had a visual field test for a certain amount of time, is also something that one needs to remember. Change in the strategy of the test uh, of the uh, visual field testing algorithm also could be an issue. So all of this has to be taken into account before we call somebody as progressing. Always check the compliance uh, with medications and the way they instill the medications, especially with elderly people. We know that if they do not have help or several of them don't want to disturb their children or their grandchildren, they tend to instill the medications by themselves and sometimes they may not be doing it right. Compliance, of course, is a definitely an issue. Timing of medication is something that we need to definitely understand. So this is more so often uh, common with those patients who possibly are trying to say that they have been using the medications well, especially because the treating doctor is asking them. Sometimes asking a leading question like in a month, how many times do you miss your medications or things like that will help us to understand if there are issues with compliance or persistence. In the presence of a progression, despite normal intraocular pressure, one particular test or one particular thought process that all of us should go through, especially in the Asian countries, is are we missing an angle closure? This is very important because it's not uncommon for us to see combined mechanism glaucoma. That means somebody who started off as a primary open angle glaucoma, as age increases because of the increase in the lens volume, they may develop a component of angle closure. It is very important to reassess gonioscopy and rule out the presence of angle closure. This is one such patient who had primary open angle glaucoma on treatment, apparently well controlled intraocular pressure, presented almost a year later with significant progression in the left eye and progression in the right eye as well. What we found that his angles were occludable and on minimal indentation, they were opening up. There were no cyanake except a couple of blotchy pigments that we could see. Even just a minimal amount of angle closure possibly is causing fluctuations in intraocular pressure, leading to progression in this patient. Another important thing that we need to remember is to ask their change in their lifestyle or anything that has happened in the recent past. Sometimes excessive fluid intake, especially uh, in certain countries like in India, there are certain um, uh, yoga exercises along with which they do uh, perform something called as uh, uh, water therapy. And when they do this, there is excessive fluid intake. That means they take about two or three liters of water at a time that can cause a fluid overload. Even alcohol for that matter, excess fluid intake of any liquid can cause increase in the choroidal volume that increases the intraocular pressure. Possibly spiking of intraocular pressure is causing 
progression in this patient. So always, it's not that they should not take the fluids, but yes, take it in limited amounts and over a period of time. Certain exercises, like I said, most often the exercises help uh, in decreasing the intraocular pressure, but certain exercises like the Sirshasan, where there is a head down posture, there could be a twofold increase in the intraocular pressure from the baseline intraocular pressure. Studies have shown that. Certain patients, when you see that there is a progression, like this gentleman had a progression, had a pre-existing glaucoma, suddenly there was an appearance of a new field effect inferiorly. And this obviously was repeatable on a repeat visual field test as well. So when we did the, and right eye was always normal, and this patient's right eye visual field at this visit showed that there was a new field effect that had developed inferiorly as well. So rather than calling somebody as progressing in both the eyes, try to keep these two fields adjacent to each other and you realize that there is a new quadrantinopia that is developed and possibly because of a cerebrovascular accident that this patient has had in the recent past. So we need to remember that our glaucoma patients also can develop a new problem like a neurological problem and they are not immune to it and that is something that one needs to remember before calling it as progression because of glaucoma alone. A middle-aged person was progressing with intraocular pressure in the low teens and this patient because of progression and we could not find out any other cause for progression because the intraocular pressures were always ranging in the low teens, underwent a filtering surgery and despite filtering surgery, he continued to progress. So you can see the downward trend in the uh, VFI that this patient was progressing in both the eyes. Every visit he would come, we would see a new disc hemorrhage that is developing and that was followed by a new nerve labellar defect that develops in that particular quadrant. And at the next visit, there is another disc hemorrhage that is developing in an adjacent area. So this was very disturbing and this patient continued to progress despite the surgery. And uh, we were wondering what to do next. So we started on additional medications. Uh, he continued to progress. And I actually sat back with him and I asked him the additional uh, history. We could rule out most of the things that we were thinking about. No, no recent uh, cardiac problem or no other systemic problem that you could think of. All the other blood parameters were normal. Uh, nothing else except possibly a history of snoring that also on uh, two, three attempts that I asked, he agreed that yes, possibly he snores sometimes. We sent him to a, a sleep specialist and we found that he had severe obstructive sleep apnea with an AHI index greater than uh, 39.5. So he was put on a positive uh, airway ventilation and following which all these disc hemorrhages stopped appearing and it remained, the fields remained stable. So obstructive sleep apnea is again an uh, important pathology. It's been there for a long time, but I guess we are recognizing it um, more commonly nowadays. So the prevalence of glaucoma is higher in them. And if somebody is progressing, uh, despite the uh, good intraocular pressure control that we think of, one needs to definitely think of obstructive sleep apnea as a cause, especially when one sees recurrent disc hemorrhages. This has been our experience. We need to understand that optic neuropathy in obstructive sleep apnea happens both because of mechanical factors, where there is raised intraocular pressure in the supine position, majority of them are obese, because of which they can also have raised episcleral venous pressure. Also, there is raised intracranial pressure in these patients. So there are certain mechanical factors that raise the intraocular pressure. Apart from that, there are also vascular factors that cause hypoxia and hypoperfusion. So there is hypoperfusion, reperfusion injury as well. All of these factors can contribute to progression of glaucoma. There was another gentleman who was diagnosed primary open angle glaucoma. This was in 2004. You can see small discs with inferior excavation in the right eye and left look essentially normal, except that there was a small superior excavation, but there were no nerve fiber layer defect. Patient was on treatment and was very regular and compliant. Over a period of time, we could see that he continued to progress. And there were every time again, new disc hemorrhages were appearing and significant progression was noted in the right eye. And the left eye also started developing a defect, the superior, uh, early superior notch with nerve labellar defect. And his intraocular pressure always ranged in the low teens. So you see that there was initially there were fluctuations, but over a period of time, we could clearly see that he was progressing in both the eyes, especially left eye, had no damage to begin with, but continued to progress. 
So he underwent a cardiac bypass surgery uh, and he had unstable blood pressures for quite some time. So that is the time when he started progressing. So we need to remember that in a glaucoma patient who's been stable for some time, if there is a new event that has happened in between, possibly that is contributing to progression as well. Whenever there is decrease in central visual acuity and there is progression in a visual field, I think one needs to be very, very careful in ruling out associated other pathologies, especially when you see the optic disc is also quite healthy. This was one such patient who had normal visual fields which suddenly progressed and this was not exactly uh, uh, respecting the vertical midline. You could see that the, uh, the field, uh, the defect also had crossed on the midline and especially inferiorly is almost uh, involving the whole of inferior hemifield. So this particular patient was asked for a neuroimaging, was found to have a large tumor and this was operated and the patient was taken care of. So whenever you see a young patient with a unilateral disease or sometimes uh, optic disc palette that is out of proportion to the cupping, atypical visual field defect or visual field defect with a central decrease in visual acuity because this is very, very uncommon to have a decrease in central visual acuity in a glaucoma test patient unless there is an advanced damage or a disc and field does not correlate or if there is a presence of color deficiency or the patient complains of decrease in contrast, these are the patients where you definitely should ask for a neuroimaging and rule out any other associated pathology. So can glaucoma progress when the intraocular pressure is well controlled? The answer for that is yes, we all know that. We do see this and these are some of the most difficult patients to treat. So we need to remember that whenever a situation like this arises, we, we need to understand that there are several other factors, patient related factor, medication related factor, possibly a new disease, systemic factor, so many other things that we need to evaluate to be able to come to a particular a conclusion or a possible diagnosis or possible uh, causative factor for this progression. So to summarize, most important thing when somebody is progressing at so-called normal intraocular pressure is possibly this intraocular pressure control is not sufficient for the patient. First thing we need to do is try and see if you can reset the target intraocular pressure try to bring down the intraocular pressure to a lower level compared to what is, it is existing now. Rule out the presence or, uh, uh, of angle closure. Always check whether there are any diurnal fluctuations in intraocular pressure. Again, that becomes very important. Ask for lifestyle changes or any habits that possibly are new and that could be contributing to these changes. Rule out sleep apnea. Blood pressure changes, especially nocturnal dip of diastolic blood pressure, very, very important. That can also cause this problem, especially if there are hypertensives, nighttime use of antihypertensive medication could be one of the problems as well. Other problems like uh, uh, neurological pathologies, any intracranial space occupying lesion, associated cardio cardiovascular accidents, especially because they're elderly patients or even sometimes contributory factors like nutritional deficiencies or B12 deficiencies could also be responsible for progression of a field defect or structural changes as well that you see in the form of new uh, changes in the optic disc as well as nerve fiber layer with disc hemorrhages. Should, we should rule out all the other associated factors and, and, and treat them appropriately. So in situations like this, think beyond the intraocular pressure, do a thorough clinical evaluation ask for additional history, systemic evaluation and appropriate investigations as discussed are very important in taking care of these patients. Thank you so much for your patience, patient listening. Good afternoon. I am Dr. Nazul Islam from Bangladesh Eye Hospital and Institute in Dhaka. I am really grateful to the Asia-Pacific Glaucoma Society and Allergan for the opportunity. I do not have any financial disclosure. I am very happy to find my three good friends, Dr. Shirisha Sentil, Dr. Dilroani Araya Singha, and Dr. Kim. We had so beautiful memories before the COVID time. Well, in next few minutes, I shall share my presentation on drops to surgery. When and what? What kind of surgery? If you look to this triangle, 
the treatment of opening the glaucoma is anti glaucoma medications laser and surgical treatment now the question is when you have to change from drops to surgical treatment to know that we have to set the target iop for every individual patient and definitely you need lower target iop when there is glaucoma damage is higher life expectancy is more there is low untreated intraocular pressure and progression is faster with some additional risk factors regarding the target pressure asia pacific glaucoma guideline third edition has given good guidelines when the glaucoma is with high risk progressive visual loss you have to reduce the pressure at least 40% or more from the initial pressure and the target pressure should be 9 to 12 mm of mercury if the glaucoma with moderate risk then you have to reduce the pressure from initial pressure at least 30% if the glaucoma suspect at moderate risk you have to reduce 20% Dr. Romanjit Shota and Dr. Tanuj Dada et al. They also beautifully showed in a India Journal of Ophthalmology that if the glaucoma is having early, moderate, or severe, you have to keep the target pressure lower. Like in early, 15 to 17; moderate, 12 to 15; severe, 10 to 12 millimeter of mercury. If you look to the literature, uh, there is many formulas to set the target pressure. One of the modified formula of Jampel is the target pressure equal to initial pressure into one minus initial pressure divided by one hundred minus Z plus minus two. In this formula, if we consider the initial pressure is twenty five, and say glaucoma is glaucoma suspect high risk Z is one, then the target pressure should be seventeen point seventy five millimeter of mercury. If we look another formula, this is variation of the Jampel formula, that target pressure can be maximum IOP minus maximum IOP percent minus Z. Similarly, if we consider 25 is the initial pressure, then target pressure comes to 17.75, exactly same like the previous formula. So you can take any formula uh, where the target pressure can be set, can be calculated, and then we have to choose. the when from drops to surgical treatment we must change if you find a patient like this the risk the target pressure good compliance stable structure in the disc and good visual field and function definitely the patient can continue medical treatment with maximum medical treatment do not need to switch over to laser or surgery but sometimes the medication has disadvantages like it may cause ocular surface disorder some patient cannot afford it is expensive affects patient general health also many patient have non responsiveness to these drugs and last but not least the quality of life is reduced in the glucose medication so in some cases we find the patient risk the target pressure stable as structure and function but the patient is having severe ocular surface disorder and poor compliance definitely we have to change from drops to the laser or surgical treatment another few groups of patients like uh, target pressure not reached with mmt definitely what to go for the surgical treatment some patient with poor compliance some patient progression in structure and function respective of the good control of the iop with the drugs even then you have to go to the surgical treatment to make it a single digit iop in future these are the groups that need surgical treatment when they first diagnosed as advanced glaucoma like cd ratio 0.8 0.9 cup the visual field is very narrow then of course you have to think of surgical treatment now the question is what kind of surgery well recently in the last decade we have different options including laser and microincisive glaucoma surgery if you look to the selective laser trabeculoplasty 
is one of the wonderful treatment because it's a cold laser it uh, unlike the alt does not have any collateral damage and it actually works and does not cause any harm and in numerous studies it is found that it reduces the iop as like as pg analogs like latanoprost many authors has found that it reduces the iop from its initial pressure from 11% to 40% very recent study published in this month in the american journal of ophthalmology the light study in they found in the china they found this selective laser tabuclast is a first line of treatment in 2015 i had a comparative study between the phacic uh, eyes and cirrhophacic eyes the slt works in both groups we found more than 22% reduction of pressure in 74% in the cirrhophacic group and 69% in the cirrhophacy group so in our population also it works now coming to the different surgical treatment dr aik ahmed given this plot of surgical treatment different surgical treatment and in which group of works say in the early glaucoma slt works trabectum this eye stent kahu dual blade they work but in the light moderate cases definitely eye stent also works but you can go to the abdominal canaloplasty gat gen implant canaloplasty like that but when the glaucoma become advanced or the very advanced cases then you see you have to do tube shunt or trabeculectomy in some cases recently in focus gen gen implant is doing good result so definitely from this diagram we can see that minimally invasive glaucoma has a role for the very early and moderate glaucoma but still the advanced glaucoma cases trabeculectomy tube shunt are the answer so minimal invasive glaucoma surgery is wonderful if we have the facility in our region but unfortunately in our region in many countries this mx are not available and not affordable by our patient but of course if we have the facility we can utilize these beautifully uh, devices and and uh, stands so that we can treat our patient even without drops in the early glaucoma and moderate glaucoma cases i had little experience with the eye stent that i got from uh, one of my american friend and uh, uh, with their guidance i have i i did few cases and definitely the eye stent and the eye stent is that gives very good result in the mild to moderate cases in many studies in the literature it proves that is quite safe in the patient after the cataract surgery if you do in the mild to moderate uh, glaucoma cases uh, they can maintain the target pressure for many years well kahuk dual blade is again a good um, mix that you can excise a part of the trabecular meshwork it is a dual blade so it cuts very nicely excise the trabecular meshwork and again i had the opportunity to have you cowd blood blade from one of my friend and i i used it and actually it works but in some cases in about 10 cases i had to do trabeculectomy after a few months in two cases so definitely in advanced glaucoma it doesn't work but in early to moderate glaucoma you can use the cowd dual blade and my hyphema is one of the complication but of course you can uh, wash it and you can maintain the uh, pressure with higher pressure now coming the bent abdominal needle goniectomy is one of my favorite surgery and i do it because it doesn't have any expenditure if we have a dead gonioscope you can do it with simply by 27g needle that is only few cents cost unlike the other mix so the same like the kahuk dual blade you make your knife bent a little bit and excise the trabecular meshwork first the 50 to 60 degree then in other part 50 to 60 degree so totally 100 to 120 degree you can excise the trabecular meshwork and it also works ashram saibani et al found in their study and ashram saibani is the inventor of the bang procedure and in their procedure they found it is very economic and cheap mizs which is equivalent in the reducing the intraocular pressure well in moderate to advanced glaucoma usually the mix do not work much but we need filtration surgery trabeculectomy or tube shunts 
in some places micropulse laser diode laser also being used in this group of patients in the recent study of the primary tube versus trabeculectomy also showed that trabeculectomy is still the gold standard for reducing the iop even it works better than the tube where the trap success rate was 72% and tube success rate was 67% so trap is still very useful surgery for the advanced glaucoma cases so in trabeculectomy and uh, uh, surgeons have their own choice some people do triangular flap quadrangular flap it has no significant difference of the result i make quadrangular flap 4 by 4 usually and make the half thickness of course in the angle to the glaucoma i make a little thicker i go about 1 mm off to the uh, limbus so i uh, enter with the 15 degree needle i use the kelis pass forcep to excise the uh, trabecular meshwork and also the peripheral cornea i do the broad base arytectomy then suturing with the tiano nylon and closing the conjunctiva watertight by 8 o vicryl uh, horizontal matrices from one corner to another corner and then uh, patency test of course and closing the surgery yes sometimes the trabeculectomy also fails so then we have to choose different kind of surgery in tube shunts are the right answer in this group of patients we have different uh, group of uh, tubes bulb one non bulb one amid glaucoma bulb valve bulb orbin aqueous drainage implant rd then pol glaucoma implant Ahmed clear path. So it's the surgeon choice who wants to use which valve or the non-valve devices. Definitely, the valve or non-valve device has its own advantages and disadvantages. So depending on the patient's requirement and indication, the valve and non-valve devices are usually chosen. So this is the uh, pol glaucoma implant, and it has another extra advantage. Its tube is narrow, 30 gauge. so when about the tube goes to the anterior chamber it takes very little space so there is very little chance of touching the cornea or the iris unlike the 23 gauge tube of the ahmed bulb or the uh, barbell implant or the rd implant and i find it is really useful even in the angle closure glaucoma cases where the sc is sometimes very shallow so it can also accommodate even in the shallow entry chamber in the angle closure glaucoma cases so tube shunt is an alternative method uh, for doing the failed or the refractory glaucoma cases well micropulse laser is being uh, used uh, more popularly now in different centers even in the uh, developing country and it has advantages that you can treat not only the advanced glaucoma also the early moderate and also advanced glaucoma cases lastly the diode laser uh, photocoagulation can be used in the advanced glaucoma cases and mostly it is very important to use in the painful blind eye from glaucoma neovascular glaucoma end stage without vision so that the patient pain become decreased pressure become reduced so in short these are the indications when we want to change from drops to different kind of surgery for different kind of glaucoma thank you so much Uh, thank you for uh, all speakers for nice presentation. Uh, there are many questions uh, from audience, and uh, especially many questions are for uh, Dr. Arya Singha. Um, the first question is, what are the limitations of ocular hypertension treatment study? What are the limitations, Dr. uh diluani uh yes uh, the limitations of ocular hypertension treatment study uh include uh their study goal was to achieve 20% reduction in iop in subjects so it may not be sufficient to protect them from primary operable glaucoma so and also there was no measure of medication adherence in those patients 
In addition, uh, the sample was a convenient sample and not a, a population-based epidemiological sample. And also the participants were considered as uh, completely healthy right at the beginning. So those were the main limitations of the ocular hypertension treatment study. Thank you. There are many uh, questions to ocular hypertension treatment study. So second uh, question is, uh, what are the factors favoring treatment outcome in uh, ocular hypertension treatment patient? What are the favorable factors for treatment in ocular hypertension treatment study? Uh, uh, Dr. Arya Shinga, please again. Yeah, factors uh, favoring the treatment in ocular hypertensive patients include uh, increased uh, untreated IOP, uh, the baseline IOP. If the IOP is very high, then it's a high risk factor. Then increased vertical cup to disc ratio. Then uh, older age has a higher risk of. Uh, primary open angle glaucoma, uh, particularly if their life expectancy is high, and uh, increase, uh, reduce corneal thickness. Thinner corneas have a higher risk of developing primary open angle glaucoma in ocular hypertensive patients. Also, if the fellow eye uh, has primary open angle glaucoma, we can consider that uh, as a factor in favor of treatment. And if the patient's fellow eye has poor vision, then we we can do consider uh, treating the uh, eye with the ocular hypertension. And uh, the third question is: What is the the outcome of a European glaucoma prevention study? Uh, Dr. Ariashinga, you presented a little bit about the European glaucoma prevention study and. What is the outcome of that study? Uh, European glaucoma uh, prevention study was actually uh, designed to evaluate uh, the efficacy of reduction of intraocular pressure by uh, using dozolamide in preventing or delaying the primary open angle glaucoma in patients with ocular hypertension. So these patients were uh, randomized uh, to treatment with uh, dozolamide or uh, treatment with placebo. And uh, they, uh, the conclusion was the dozolamide reduced the pressure by about only 15 to 22%. And uh, the EGPS actually uh, did not or failed to detect a statistically significant difference between medical therapy and the placebo group in reducing the incidence of primary open angle glaucoma in ocular hypertensive patients. Oh, thank you. Um, and next question is uh, to Dr. Uh, Sentil. Um, the, the, how does center cornea thickness influence intraocular pressure measurement? Unmute, please. Yeah, so the, the fact that the central corneal thickness has gained so much of importance uh, is, I think, uh, the credit goes to the OHTS study. Uh, but so how do we use it in clinical practice and how does it influence the intraocular pressure? So if the Goldman Affination Tonometer is the gold standard for intraocular pressure estimation in our clinics. And the central corneal thickness actually affects the way the intraocular pressure is measured by GAT. So when... Uh, Goldman designed the tonometer. He assumed that everybody's corneal thickness was possibly an average of 520, and hence an intra, a corneal thickness that is above uh, 520 or less than 520 has an influence on the way the pressures are recorded. So thicker corneas, we overestimate the intraocular pressure. Thinner corneas, we under, underestimate the intraocular pressure with GAT. And the same holds true even for other tonometers. So anything that is through the cornea, because you measure an indirect estimation of intraocular pressure over the ocular surface, that is on the surface of the cornea, 
and corneal properties and especially the corneal thickness and the other uh, uh, biomechanical properties definitely influence the way we record the intraocular pressure. Oh, thank you. Um, and uh, this is my question. Uh, there are many persons to receive laser reflective surgery. And how do you measure the intraocular pressure in such patients in, in your clinical practice? Dr. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Kim. That's a wonderful question. I think this is one of the biggest challenges that we face. So high myopic eyes are more prone for glaucoma. It's very difficult to estimate glaucoma in these patients and more so if they undergo a refractive surgery which has remodeled the cornea, uh, it is even more difficult for us to estimate the intraocular pressure in that. So there are several factors that people talk about, but I, with whatever experience that I have in treating these patients, I would say that if somebody has a suspicious optic disc and has a positive family history of glaucoma, visual fields have to be done on a regular basis. That's the only thing that will tell you whether there's any functional change happening or not. And of course, the structural tests do help, but to some extent. The measurement of intraocular pressure, whichever tonometer is used, I think it's important to use the same tonometer over a period of time. So somebody was recorded 14, 15 intraocular pressure, and let's say three years down the line or five years down the line, the pressures are in the range of 20s or 25. So obviously, you know, the pressures are going up. Uh, so then, you know, you treat, but if somebody's pressures were 10 and 12, and they're only about 14, 15 or 16 now, but disc is showing changes, that is where we get into confusion. So in these cases, I think we know that we underestimate the intraocular pressure. So for me, intraocular pressure estimation is essential to understand how we treat it and how much to lower. But whether there is glaucoma or not, I think that we have to diagnose by the structural evaluation. And of course, by doing a visual field test to know if there is a functional loss. So CCT has to go hand in hand uh, up, uh, with intraocular pressure estimation and structural evaluation and functional tests. So it's, it's a complex answer to that question that you asked. I have a question to Dr. Sirisha, uh, with permission of Dr. Kim. Uh, here is a question that uh, a patient having normal tension glaucoma and estimation of target pressure is about 12, but the patient is having 16. With three medications, the pressure doesn't come less than 14. So how to manage this case? Because patient is controlled within a normal, but uh, still there is progression. Patient is having progression for lifetime. So what is your suggestion treating this case? Because even with three medications, the IOP is not coming to that target patient. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nasrul Islam, and good to see you. Thank you. Uh, so I think what I have put together in the presentation were actually all the clinical types of cases that we come across on a daily basis. So I would say rule out angle closure. I'm sure if you are treating it, you would have definitely ruled that out. And look at all the other associated risk factors. So these are patients who actually will require a little bit of our time, sit with them, speak to them, understand uh, their lifestyle. In fact, I can give you an example of a doctor who was going to a gym in the recent past and he was progressing. It was one night and he was progressing and he was telling me uh, that when I, when I kept on asking him questions, he was actually on some diet supplements that had a steroid. So until which level do you grill to find out what their daily you know, lifestyle is like and what changes have, they, have happened in the recent past, I think is very, very important for us to know whether, is there an additional steroid that they're using? Is there a systemic factor that is causing this problem? Is there an ocular factor uh, like instilling the drops? So for me, I would say that if they're not instilling the drops well, they're not working. Yes. So yes. as simple as that, so ocular, systemic, as well as their behavioral and lifestyle changes, I think we need to rule out uh, before we say that uh, we give up on them. Thank you. I have another question, Dr. Dilroani. The patient, you have already nicely told, very excellent presentation about uh, ocular hypertension study, and it showed that you need to treat some of them, otherwise it will progress. So is there any role of SLT in reducing IOP in case of ocular hypertension? Uh, there's a recent study coming up, as you mentioned, the light uh, one in UK and one in China. So they have actually proven uh, the benefit of SLT in, uh, as a primary treatment in ocular hypertension, uh, also in glaucoma. So there is a role of SLT in ocular hypertension. Yes. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, oh, yeah, there are many questions from audience and- I have one, are... I think I find one question to me. Uh, is I find here, wonderful yes. surgery by Dr. Slama, when you go for primary tube indication in your hand and your important take home message on any specific tube. Very nice question and thank you so much. I think, uh, first of all, we try not to be the primary surgery tube in our context in Bangladesh. Um, but still, in some cases, say in, in neovascular glaucoma, in inflammatory glaucoma, eye syndrome, we know that trabeculectomy failure is very high. The success is very low. So definitely in these cases, you can try the primary tube surgery. This is my choice. And my personal choice is the bulb one, the Ahmed glaucoma bulb. Because I find more comfortable after doing the Ahmed glaucoma bulb, I can control the patient pressure nicely. But for the bar belt, or the RD, you have to tie the tube and definitely post operative there might be some higher intraocular pressure. And in the very advanced glaucoma cases that cannot be really expected, might have some more progression. So definitely my choice is the bald one. And for myself is the Ahmed glaucoma bald. Thank you for the question. The, uh, Dr. King, please. There are still many questions, but uh, we should have a uh, last questions. Um, there are many questions about the, the relationship between uh, blood flow and glaucoma. So would you sum up about the systemic blood flow and glaucoma? Please uh, answer that question, uh, yeah. Dr. Sentil. Yes. Yeah. Thank Please. you. So ocular blood flow plays a very important role uh, as far as the glaucoma occurrence as well as the progression is concerned. So when there is more importantly a dysregulation, a vascular dysregulation and autonomic neuropathy, these are two important factors that can actually cause this problem. So whenever there is a hypoperfusion, decreased blood flow, and then there is a reperfusion. So you have this hypoperfusion, reperfusion, because of which there is also a lot of damage, free radical damage, nitrous oxide that gets released and things like that. So that causes ultimate damage to the retinal ganglion cells. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, unfortunately we are beyond the time schedule. So I will uh, close this webinar and thank all speakers and participants for this webinar thank you i was so thank you uh thank again all speakers for participating in webinar and especially thank webinar sponsor Elegan. and please save the date for 20th november for next webinar in the apgs series new surgical technique in glaucoma thank you again all participants I will close this session. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.